So, hello everyone, thank you for coming. This is the uh, kickoff meeting for year 2016, and in the same style of 2015, we have wonderful Jeffro uh, doing a, a really interesting talk to be determined. I hope so. Uh, so, a couple of exciting things. Their intention is to continue to have six weekly meetups. I have a few really awesome speakers lined up. We did a survey in the last meetup of last year, of which Everyone that did come to the meetup didn't fill it out, but everyone that didn't come did fill it out. So we're going to go with the metrics anyway. Uh, the consensus generally was that we want to hear more customers, what customers are doing with AWS and the problems that they're experiencing. So the intention is to move forward with that in mind. Uh, apart from that, I noticed yesterday or two days ago that Jeff Barr had retweeted uh, Bronnie's Twitter message where it's going, over there, so we're now famous. <laughs> He's got 42,000 followers, so that's pretty cool. Um, apart from that, thank you all for coming, and Buzzy wants to say a few words. We're, I'm hiding over he's here. over here, so I'll hand it over, and then we'll kick off with the talk. Thank you. Hey guys, how are you going? Um, for anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Richard Busby. I'm a solution architect. I work for AWS and based down here in Wellington. Um, really, really quickly, we're going to run the AWS Summit in Auckland again, as we have done for the last three years. It'll be Wednesday, I think it is, the 29th of June. Registrations haven't gone live yet, um, but when they do, uh, we're expecting an awful lot more people this year. We're going to move it, I think, to run in the cloud on the waterfront uh, because the previous venue has a, a capped limit. Um, but we still expect to potentially sell it out. Um, so if you are interested in going up for and going to it, register early. Don't like wait until two weeks out and then phone me because um, that makes my life really miserable. Um, yeah, that, that's all I had to say. Um, any other questions, please give me a yell. Cheers. Awesome, just the, well, thank you, Sebastian, for the intro and for also organising this relatively successful event. Yeah, thank you. Um, so my name is Jeffrey Carr. I work at Fairfax Media as a solutions architect here in New Zealand, running the Stuff.co.nz platform. I've had four hours sleep tonight, last night. So at the moment, you all kind of look like Elasticsearch clusters going wrong. So if I get a little bit more delirious during my talk, I do apologise in advance. Um, it's normally not that bad, honest. It's usually pretty good. Um, so, Fairfax and Amazon, what's the deal? We've been using Amazon for a while, since about 2012. Initially, like most customers, experimenting and then rapidly going, hey, this is really, really exciting, jumping on board and going full in. Um, massive use trans Tasman, both by the Australian business and the New Zealand business. And in the case of New Zealand, we are 100% Amazon hosted for all internal systems, 100% Amazon hosted for all of our direct partnering vendors, um, and that's probably about 90% of the content on the Dub the Dub Stuff website. So, you know, that's pretty much, we've drunk the Kool-Aid, and we're going full in. Cloud's pretty awesome. You know, I got sick of the old days having to rack up hardware and finding out that I uh, didn't have enough capacity, or we bought the wrong kind of hardware, or it was just really bad hardware. Pretty much all the ways bad hardware. Cloud's awesome. We can innovate faster. We can do really, really cool stuff. We can build systems in parallel. Life's perfect. All our problems are solved. There's a slight issue around the build. Um, the build gets kind of big. And I mean, this is good. We're all using Amazon. We're enjoying Amazon. Everyone wants to spin up new stuff on Amazon. But print media, for some reason, isn't that great on revenue. And costs are kind of important. So we've got a little bit of an issue. In fact, I would say that cost control for us is our biggest challenge in cloud computing, by far. It's not only a technology issue. Technology problems we can solve. We're technologists. We know how to automate systems. We know how to address faults. We know how to think and respond to things very, very quickly in intelligent fashions. The real problem is cost control is a business and cultural problem in your organization. And this is actually a lot harder to solve than just writing a bunch of scripts. To reduce costs, you need to have your whole business on board. You need your operational teams to be aware of what they're building, what they're doing, thinking about cost in the same way that you think about CPU consumption, performance metrics, and anything else that matters on a, on a production platform. And you need feedback and support between teams. You can't have architects building a system and throwing it over a wall and saying, make this thing run or oh, make it 10% cheaper. You have to understand how to make things cheaper, how to design for cost. You've got to understand the concepts of auto scaling. Um, it's really, really important. And you also need to actually have buy-in from the business around how budgets work. 
It's no good having a, biz a business organization where your budget is use it or lose it approach because it doesn't work in the cloud. You might as well spin up as much stuff as you want, get a bigger budget next quarter and move on with your life and enjoy it. You need to have a business that's aware that actually this quarter you used under budget because you optimized and that doesn't mean you should be cut in the following quarter. In fact, I would say consider cost a technical debt. Just like tech debt, cost will build up over time. And if you don't tackle any of it, it will hurt. It will hurt really badly. And in the same way as technical debt, we ideally try to prioritize it, attack it, and reduce it over time to keep it manageable, you need to do the same with your costs. And it's actually more than just your team. You know, in a big organization, there's many, many heads, like a giant hydra of print media. And you need to have all your teams on board across different departments, but you also need to have your vendors on board. As a customer, I love saving money from my vendors. And if you're a vendor, you've got two problems when a customer comes to you and says, hey, you need to knock 10% off our bill. Either you reduce your amount of hours that you bill, so you lose money. You reduce your rate for your consultants, you lose money. Neither of those are that great. I mean, as a consultant in past life, I don't like losing money. I mean, I mean, it's the whole point of my existence. If you can drop the spend of compute that your client is using, that is a direct return or a direct benefit to your client that doesn't necessarily have to compromise your billable rate. As a vendor, you need to be cost aware as well, not only for yourself, but for your clients, and making sure that they feel they're getting value for money. Basically, you want to be a partner with your customer, not simply an expense. I want to know that you've got my best interests in heart and you're designing systems that are suitable. So this sounds great. You know, I've talked about a whole bunch of stuff about culture, technology, whipping vendors, you know, everyone loves doing the stuff. How's it working out for Fairfax? Well, yeah, it's, it's not quite perfect. So the short answer is we're not the worst by far. I've seen way, way worse bill control issues and cost control issues in large organizations. But I'm not going to say we're the best either. We definitely have a fair share of considerable cost problems in our organization. Um, and I'm going to go through some of that because I actually want to talk to you guys, not just, hey, we're awesome because we optimize our costs, but here's how we've done it and also here's where we're failing and here's what we're trying to do to resolve it. Um, so let's start with success because, you know, I want to pump up our awesome organization. We've done massively cost-efficient pre-production environments. Uh, I would say we're probably spending about 10% of a former cost on our pre-pods. So that's UAT, staging, etc. cetera. Um, really happy with that. We've got, I would consider, a reasonably good understanding how to design architect for cloud environments and how to get cost-effective designs. And we're developing a culture amongst the teams for cost awareness. Um, and that's across the business, also not just the technology. Fairfax is a print company or a media company. Um, there's always a conscious aspect of how can we save money, how can we reduce costs, how can we do it cheaper and better. Sometimes, unfortunately, it does involve flying Jetstar, but we'll survive. And we've done pretty good on some other things. You know, we've got a good volume of reserved instance hours to on-demand. You know, we've got about 10% on-demand, 90% reserved instances for our production environment. I'm pretty happy with those sort of ratios. Jeez, but was that per month? That's per month, yeah. Um, but we've got a whole bunch of failures. But actually, let's not call it failures because, you know, this is kind of a sort of business e-manager type talk, so let's call it unrealized potential for future successes in the next sprint of the hypercloud. Um, there's still a lot more waste than we'd like. There's about 17 to 20, I would say 17 to 20 percent waste in our account currently. Now that's a lot. That's taking, going to your shop, buying a delicious Kit Kat, taking off one piece and crushing it underfoot never to be eaten again. That's actually, I don't want to lose that much Kit Kat. I like Kit Kats. I'm not going to set 20 percent loss in my bill. We've got real serious problems attributing cost to departments. Now, it's really easy to say to, to a whole technology team, hey, guys, you need to say, you know, this 20% of waste is unacceptable. Cut the cost, save the money. But every team goes, oh, well, it's not my systems. Mine are perfect. We've got the finest engineers in the company. So the other team don't know what they're doing. Bunch of muppets. And we've got the problem of that, again, teams aren't going at the same speed. It's easy to get aggravated at the team or complacent about your own skills. But not all teams are equal. They've got different backgrounds, different experiences. In, in different in different skill sets. And that's a, that's a real challenge to solve. So I'm going to do that slide and actually talk about what we actually, what are some of our waste problems. That 20% is pretty scary. What's going on in there? For us, the vast majority is easy to compute. Um, this is probably similar to a lot of customers' bills. Compute's expensive in general. That's not saying Amazon's more expensive than another vendor, but computers actually cost a fair bit of money to operate and to actually crunch numbers. Um, 
EBS storage, again, <coughs> storage is expensive, always has been, still way cheaper than running traditional SANs, and I do not miss that for a moment, um, but it is something that does add up very, very quickly. And of course, data transfer. We're a very high data, or high, high transfer volume company. We're serving massive amounts of traffic um, domestically and internationally, and that does cost significant amounts of money. So this is pulled from the um, bidding dashboard on Amazon. That big blue thing is our, is our compute bill. It vastly outweighs all other services we consume from Amazon. Um, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty scary, though. It's a lot of well, what they're doing. You know, we're not we're not making bitcoins. If we were, it'd be profitable. Um, mm -hmm. This is something else. So what can we can tell? Well, we know it computes expensive, but RDF was actually quite a small bit. I mean, if I go back one, RDF is that green slice. That's really cheap for big enterprise databases that don't go down and have multi ad redundancy. And that's kind of weird because it does depend a little bit on where your organization is. If you're a small startup, RDS is an extremely expensive premium product because you're paying for, I don't know, two M3 medium boxes, multi AZs, all that nice management stuff that comes with it. You can't decide to run it on a single T2 micro in a really dodgy manner. Well, you maybe can, but you shouldn't. But it's an expensive product. For a big enterprise, it's dirt cheap because of the quality of what you're getting, it's unsurpassable in my view. Um, S3 is ridiculously cheap for storage. Like, compared to the cost of buying traditional SANs and stuff, it's very, very cheap until you accidentally put the video bucket on the live website without any caching and burn through $3,000 in 12 hours. Uh, but, you know, aside from, that, aside from that slight hiccup, um, Lambda. Lambda is really cool. If you guys haven't played with it yet, I really encourage you to. I'll go over it a little bit more later on. But Lambda is you're paying for compute by 100 milliseconds. Turns out computers kind of do repetitive things really fast, and if you don't screw up your network I.O., Lambda is actually really, really cost effective because you get stuff done in record time and pay millisecond for it. Okay, so we know EC2 is big, we know it's a problem, why is it so big? Well, pets are probably the number one problem in our organisation. Um, you know, I, I, love, I love Bessie, she's a great cow, you know, she came into the house one day, made herself at home, never left, but Bessie has to go to a network. She's too expensive to run, We've got to get something more effective. It's a real, real problem for us. And the other big problem is Muppets. In any organization, <laughs> you're guaranteed to find Muppets. And now Muppets are an interesting problem because there's always another team of Muppet. But your colleague, if he's next to you, is good. But if he's away from you down a phone line, of course he's a Muppet because you can't interact with him and therefore he's doing it all wrong. So Muppets come and go and they're very hard to catch. Uh, basically assume everyone but you is a Muppet. Well, actually, it's a little bit unfair. Most people we work with are generally intelligent. Well. I hope so anyway, otherwise I feel sorry for you. Um, intelligent people can make poor decisions surprisingly often. And the main reason for that is bad conditions. We're given them bad information, with bad tooling, with bad training. They don't know how to respond properly, and then other teams who maybe have had a different advantage in that area get aggravated with them very, very quickly. So you want, you want to try and prevent <laughs> Muppetry. Now, the person who can solve Muppetry is going to make billions on the fucking Gartner circuits talking about you know, saving businesses and making them 100 times more profitable. And it's never going to entirely, entirely happen. But you want to prevent obvious muppetry around your cost, cost issues. You've got to encourage a culture around the cost focusing of the company. You've got to provide tooling. It's really easy to say to a team, well, you guys are running this pre-prod system 24 hours a day. Why don't you just turn it off? Duh. But you're, you're a senior DevOps engineer who knows how to automate all this stuff. And they're like a Windows guy who's only had experience running Exchange. They don't have that training and that knowledge. And if you just say, solve it and get the fuck out of the way, they don't respond well to that. And, they, and then, to be fair, they can't. They haven't had that training and support. So if you're running a big enterprise, something like a fairfax size company, and you're just telling other teams to solve problems but not giving them the tooling and the training, you need to rethink that. You need to go, actually, we've got this really skilled DevOps team that developed these tools. Hey, guys in the other business, here are some tools you can use. We'll show you how we're doing it in our system. We're sharing some of that knowledge. And that's actually really hard. Companies suck at sharing knowledge across teams. I mean, that's the whole reason why DevOps is so successful, so loved. You know, finally someone decided that you get a dev and an op to talk together. And it's like, holy shit, stuff happens. I mean, <laughs> whoa, radical. But it's a common problem. You know, every business doesn't talk to their own teams. You've got to try and fight that to actually attack cost control, certainly in your compute environment. And I guess it reflects you've got to put time into people. I mean, if you never train your staff, you never teach them things, you're going to have problems long term. Having said that, not all Muppetry can be fixed without a little bit of pain. Like sometimes, you know, that person who just keeps spinning up the C3 4X large to run their WordPress blog for their personal use just needs a little bit of a smack around the face. T2 
So for that, at Fairfax, we had Delete Block 9000. Invented by my excellent colleague, Paul, in Australia, Delete Block 9000 deletes any system that doesn't have the appropriate billing tag at Fairfax. Now, writing a bot actually takes work, so Delete Bot may or may not actually be a grumpy architect who just goes and deletes everything when he has to reconcile the bill if he finds out it hasn't been tagged. But either way, it delivers results. You know, 9,000% success on Delete Bot 9,000, we stand by it. That leads me to a point which is, you're going to have to write some policies around your cost control situation, and you're going to have to enforce them. But you need to be sensible and write a reasonable policy. In the same way that no one loves filling out a 40-page security audit document with a new vendor, you've got to write policies that are easy. It should be a couple of pages, max, describing what you're trying to solve, what's, what's critical, and making sure we work to that. So at Fairfax, for example, we do a lot of tagging to identify what costs are going where. So our policy is basically the following tags must exist. Basically, business unit, project, that sort of thing, so we can actually figure out what's going on in our bill. Once you've got the policy in place, then you can look at enforcing it via technology methods, whether it's automatic deletion or a lot of nagging. Um, surprisingly, automatic deletion works a bit better than lots of nagging. Um, I don't quite know why. Um, it's definitely more cost effective. Maybe it's just Fairfax. Maybe we suck and you guys have this all figured out and you're sitting back on your beautiful 99% CPU loaded boxes with no, uptime, uh, no load average issues and you know, it's all, it's all wonderful. Um, really? Like, I don't think this is unique to any large company. Any large company is going to have waste, whether it's in technology departments or elsewhere. But it's even easier to do it in an online environment where you're just a click away from spending several thousands of dollars. You don't have to go place an order form for a server anymore, you can just click a button and spend money. It's, it's, it's a great liberating power, but with great power comes great responsibilities. So the first thing is, if you don't think you've got a cost control problem, or even if you do, do you even measure? If you don't measure your systems, how do you even know what waste you've got and what you're looking at? You don't run your production web service going, hey, if CPU will be doing something, it'll be fine, and that memory is detail. No, as an engineer, you watch that stuff religiously. You want to know, what's my response time? What's my performance? What's my uptime? Cost is no different. Cost is an additional parameter on your compute environments, just like CPU, memory, disk, cost. In fact, I really want New Relic to add a graph to the bottom of my APM modules, which is cost, because that would be really, really useful. You will have waste. I guarantee it. Absolutely. Go and find your waste, because that's where you can make some big savings for your company. Amazon actually come to a party with us. You know, despite being a vendor, you know, that is happy in taking your money, they also give you a bunch of tools. So when you complain about the cost, they can say, well, have you used the tools? Come on, guys. I'm trying to help you here. Um, probably the first three things, trusted advisor. Um, you guys probably used it before for looking at security, performance, and other issues. Um, cost Explorer, you can dive around that bill a little bit more. Or actually, just read the fucking bill. Like, there are so many engineer teams that don't ever actually look at the invoice. Like, have you actually seen your cost from your organization? Probably not. A lot of teams don't end up looking at it because it's handled by accounts or someone higher up. But if you don't get to see the cost you're spending, you're not really incentivized to actually try and improve, and you can't even measure it. If you can't measure it, you can't even have the um, egotistical boost that comes with dropping the graph slightly. You've got nothing. So Trusted Advisor, just for those who haven't seen it, looks a bit like that. Tells you about cost optimization, performance, security, fault tolerance. Um, I blocked out the box here how much we waste, because A, it's embarrassing, and B, I don't know if it's confidential. Um, but you can log on there straight away, and Amazon's telling you already what you need to do to save some money. Like, it ain't hard, right? Two clicks, boom, save some money. Very, very nice. Um, tells you some interesting stuff. So it's a little bit hard to see probably from the back there, but Trusted Advisor is telling me right now that someone's running a R3 8X large, which is, you know, got a little bit of RAM on it, um, and it costs about 3,000 bucks a month, and they're using 0.6% CPU. So, I mean, to be fair, it's a large memory box. Maybe they've got a lot of stuff in memory, but 0.6% CPU kind of sounds like someone's just left a box running and not actually doing anything with it. That's a good saving. You know, I'll happily take that money and spend it on beer every month. You know, I can look down here, I can see a bunch of R3 2X larges, 3% CPU. The most insulting is I can see a C3 4X large. It's a high compute cluster. The whole point of a C3 is for massive amounts of compute, and it's using 4.3% CPU. Just fucking put on a T1, T2 micro, guys, come on. So, very quickly, you can already see some of the stuff where you can make savings. And it's just a little bit of thinking. Look at the, look at the metrics. Pick the most obvious. Like, I can probably save, you know, maybe... 50,000 by going through that entire list and optimizing every last one. But I can save, you know, 5, 10k straight away from the first page without even looking further than that. Prioritize some of the easy wins. Go in there and grab them. Um, so, when you have these situations, do you actually go and talk to the team, 
We do. It, it does depend on the BUs and the teams that are doing it. Um, generally, we try across our team, which is on our online space, to talk to other teams and say, hey, guys, you're wasting money here. Depending on the team, someone's like, oh, cool, thanks for letting us know. You know, someone spun this up, we need to go kill it. Other times it goes, oh, we're very important, we're big data, so we need big boxes, we're working on this thing, and, you know, it kind of just washes over them. And, you know, that's a question more for the business sometimes. It's like, hey, this team's wasting money, you can see how much, you need to go have that chat with them. But it does depend on the team's attitude. And that's why the culture is important as well. If you haven't got that culture and the ability to go to another team and say, hey guys, you're wasting money in a friendly manner, then it doesn't go anywhere. Um, this is another one from our Trusted Advisor report. It's telling me what reserved instances to buy. Now I'll talk a little about reserved instances for those who haven't used them before. But essentially you can say to Amazon, hey, I commit to using this type of machine for this amount of time and you give me a better rate. And right now it's telling me, hey, Jeffrey, you're running 11 M4X large Windows boxes. You know, you can save a thousand bucks a month just by reserving these in. If I'm running loads for three years nonstop, that's a good savings I can make. Why not? Um, there's also Cost Explorer. I've never really used it much. And the most reason for that is we actually use a commercial tool called Cloud Checker. Uh, Cost Explorer just gives you some graphs about your overall spend, but I find it a little bit arbitrary, a little bit too basic. Um, but it's, you know, it's worth looking at if you've got nothing else. Um, Finding you're getting to the point of reading the bill, you can actually explode out. No, don't read, don't read the PDFs. Like no one's got that much time in their life, um, but you can explode out your consolidated bill and your per account bill in the Amazon console and actually even look through and see what's in there. And you find some interesting stuff. For example, I can see how much we pay blended rate for compute based on the spot price our bids are put in and how many hours I consume every month. You can look at the blended rate for your per hour cost of on demand systems or reserved machines. You can actually see what each type of compute is costing you and look through the bill details. It's quite interesting because you find some weird stuff that pops up, like people running R3 2 weeks larges um, suddenly on the bill and how much it's actually costing the business. But those tools are a little bit basic, unfortunately. I mean, Amazon's done well, you're trying to provide information, but there's a lot of data there. And in fact, I would say that tip around where if you're a large company like us, you probably need a business intelligence person full time just to look through the stuff. Um, we could certainly probably justify it from the savings alone. Um, unfortunately at the moment we kind of operate on a technology team owns it, which is kind of like you've got architects looking at bills, figuring out what's going on, which they do a great job, but they shouldn't really be doing that job. That could actually be a, a full-time accountant slash BA person. Um, anyway, to try and stay sane, these people will look at this bill, use a couple of tools. So we've used Cloudability in the past, it's quite lightweight, maybe quite nice if you're on a startup or a small company, but I didn't find it quite powerful enough. We're using a tool called Cloud Checker, annoyingly without an ER, just an R. Um, I hate them all. Cloud Checker is not that good. Um, very, very, I would say the software is quite expensive for what it is, and the problem with it is it's actually quite sluggish. You go, hey, show me this bill, do this filter, and you sit there and you watch it churn and churn and churn. It's like, fuck's sake, guys, compute ain't hard. You, you, you're telling me the cost of compute from a provider that provides me compute on demand, and I'm waiting for a graph to be drawn. What's going wrong? Um, and I guess that's kind of a problem I've got with a lot of the commercial tools at the moment is they're just a little bit immature around getting data out, or certainly for a large scale organization. They're quite good if you've got an individual account per BU or per customer, because you can log onto it and say, give me the overall stats of this account, and you get some lovely graphs and some lovely metrics. But it's not great when you've got 20 different BUs sharing an account, which is another problem in itself, I admit, because um, you can't break down that information very easily. For example, with Cloud Checker, I can break down the cost of a specific project. I can break down cost per BU. But if I want to break down the cost for a whole bunch of related projects via like a wildcard, you can't do it. So you have to go to your report and add in all the tags one by one. You don't want to do that. You want automatic systems that are very, very easy and very, very fast to use. Um, so I guess this is a call to arms. I mean, I would love to see some really good vendors emerge with technology to deal with this. Other people are using you know, Sumo Logic, Splunk, those sort of systems. I think a lot of them form the same problem in that you try and do certain things, they're doing really well, but then you do this one other thing that's really important to you and they just fall apart a bit. Um, so I'm interested to see what other people are using as well. That too. I mean, Cloud Checker is not a cheap service. We can justify it based on the amount of money you've saved. I mean, one mess, one mess up that spends five grand a day wasted data can pay for the Cloud Checker bill very, very quickly, but you still feel bad handing over the amount of cash to actually use it. Um, but fundamentally, and allocation of costs from different BUs is a real pain in the ass. It's actually really, really difficult. So Amazon had this brilliant idea. Just give everything a tag, because tags are awesome. Sweet as. 
Except that not everything's tagged in Amazon. <laughs> in fact, even more insultingly, EBS snapshots are taggable, except that it forms a singular line item on your invoice. So every month we get an invoice that says we've spent uh, $35,000 on snapshots across the entire enterprise. Now, that's, that's great, really, really great information. Who do I bill that for? Although those snapshots are tagged, I can't tell if it was my team that's responsible for that disaster or another team that's responsible for the disaster. I can make assumptions around the number of snapshots or the size of the volumes, but because they're incremental, that's not necessarily accurate either. I could have 100 snapshots that are tiny or two snapshots that are massive. So there's a few annoyances like that. I mean, to the credit, Amazon's got better and better. ELBs are taggable now, more and more stuff's coming on board, but there is still that annoying gap between a new product that's got launched and now the tag. And that's quite frustrating. So really, tagging is the best way if you're in one account, but because of the poor tooling and the poor, oh, the, lack, the lack of support of tags on certain resources, you're better off using a master consolidated account than various sub-accounts. So, for those who aren't familiar with account consolidation, if you're new to Amazon, you've created your account with your credit card, you've got nuts, launched a bunch of boxes, and you've had a lot of fun, that's awesome. Please delete that account and start again. You need to create a new account that has just your IEM users and your billing, and then you create an account per business unit or per customer, depending on with your internal company or consultancy. Split them out to multiples and only rely on the master for the consolidated bill and for the IEM users. Consolidated billing is kind of interesting. What happens essentially is you get a singular invoice, well, you get 50 invoices because Amazon, but you get some sort of invoices come through against that master one for all the dependent accounts. And you can do things like reserve instances either on the master consolidated account that apply to the cost for all accounts, or you can do them on the individual accounts, in which case it still applies to all of them, but you can have guaranteed reservations. But the key part of doing this is you're getting, or you're containing the BUs in their own myth. You're basically containing the menace of different teams into one place. And it's very, very handy because they can only then blame themselves when the bill comes in for their account. If you have consolidated accounts, you're not worrying about is that $35,000 or snapshots that team or that team? You know exactly how much comes from a particular one. You can look at data transfer costs and see how much comes from a particular one. Okay, so let's say we've done all that. We've got some awesome business intelligence software, some awesome analytics, we've got measurements in place there front and centre. We take a lot of the techies. What do we do next? How do we actually make savings knowing that we've got waste in place? Turn stuff off. Now, I don't mean our site, please don't turn our site off. That's actually kind of annoying when it happens. Um, do you need your pre production environments 24 7? Sorry, I think you're missing a 7. Um, do you actually need your environments 24 7? Probably not, you know. I mean, some people got developers who love to work crazy hours, but I guarantee there are hours in the day your environments aren't actually in use. So we've got two approaches at Fairfax. We've got a tool called Cloud Cycler. Um, that's really, really rudimentary, but what it does is quite reliable and it just turns systems on and off at certain times of the day. Hey, it's 6 a.m., probably launch a whole bunch of boxes. Oh, it's end of the day, shut them all down. And we do that on a per stack level. So we find the CloudFormation stack, we can tear down an entire stack, ELB, everything, and then rebuild it every morning. Um, saves a ridiculous amount of money, but it is very crude. It's the equivalent of just you know, smashing it with a hammer, because you say, hey, people only work between this hour and this hour, and no flexibility allowed. Not the greatest system, but it's a good way to get your costs under control in a real emergency. If you've got big cost control problems, it's a quick and easy way to start. We've been experimenting something recently called Flywheel. Um, Flywheel is a, essentially a reverse proxy, and it runs on like a small T2 micro box. And if you proxy your request through it, when you request a particular system or backend, it actually goes and launches that backend for you. So you might spend you know, 60 seconds when you first hit the pre-prod system waiting for it to launch, but then it comes up and actually starts serving content. Hey, Jeff, right, these are open-source projects that Fairfax have created. Indeed. Uh, they're both available online. Um, I haven't been using Flywheel myself. My team's and you have been doing that quite a bit. Um, so Cloud Cycle has been in place for a long time and because they're pretty reliable. Um, I mean, everyone reinvents this stuff all the time. It's like puppet modules and um, user data. Everyone rewrites the same bloody stuff over and over again. So we're trying to share what we do. Not always as much as we'd like, but trying to avoid some of the competition. So you have the EC2 instance running all the time that manages that? Thing. Yeah, so there's a small box that runs running Cloud Cycler going, hey, what time is it? Hey, it's time to shut down a whole bunch of boxes. Oh, for these systems, I'll tear down the stacks because they're fully um, fully stateless. We can tear them down and restore them. That's fine. 
where your other systems are going actually, yeah, okay, that one's a pet. Uh, we'll shut down the instance, but leave it in place. We'll actually delete it. Yeah. Um, so it depends on the, on the platform in question. Um, one of the problems we had is with the older parts of business, like the main AU parent uh, side of company, because we started on Amazon and evolved onwards, Cloud Cycle was a later introduction. And it's really hard saying to a business, hey, by the way, we're going to turn off your pre prod systems at this time. They go, whoa, it's been running all this time, and you know, we budgeted for it, we won't keep it running. And you're like, well, are you actually using it? No, but that's not the point. It was much easier when we created the Invent side of or the Invent accounts because we could say, hey, we're going to run your apps for you, but it's only going to run between these hours and these hours in pre prod. And if you want it otherwise, you will come send me a Gordon letter explaining why. Surprise, surprise, there's very few systems that actually run 24 7 because most of them don't need to be. Um, having said that, there are, fault, there are issues with that approach. I'd rather everything be on demand and not have to wait between specific hours, but it actually works better than I thought it would. I was quite surprised actually how many people do go home. Um, I wish I was one of them. Um, moving on. Avoiding pets. I mentioned pets before. Single best thing you can do for your cost control. There's many, many cases where we get, hey, we can't adjust the system, it's too critical, it's too special, it's got some magical clustering thing that breaks if you touch it, so we're going to make it as big as possible to make sure it never goes down. Or we've got great ones, which is, we only bought one license for this app. Oh, you want multi-AZ support? Oh, yeah, definitely, but you got one license? Yeah. Cool. Um, we'll do a really good job for you on that one, guys. Um, and that becomes a problem, because you can't auto-scale it. That machine then becomes the biggest, biggest pet you can possibly find, because you can't build additional ones, you can't cut it, it's going to become big. If you can find those pets and get rid of them, you'll have a much, much better day. Having said that, it's not always going to happen. I mean, I will confess we have things that are maybe not pets, but are different cattle with names. Um, some of that is due to the technologies that we've, had, we've purchased or acquired over time. And I'll say most of your large organisations are going to have some amount of pets in them. Key thing is identify them, know what other pets, and try and minimise it as much as possible. Sizing. I love sizing. Every team's like, oh, I need, you know, 32 gig of RAM and 12 CPUs, and, you know, that's what my gaming box at home has, and that wasn't that expensive. But do you actually need that for your Node.js app or your WordPress blog? Possibly not. Um, a lot of our designs were initially, we'll start trying to figure out what the requirements are for a particular machine, based on estimated loads and past patterns and past applications, and then we'll spec different machine types. And yes, for a big project, you still have to spec stuff and you can't completely toss out all architectural principles. But in many cases, you can start a lot smaller and iterate very quickly. Most of our projects are, hey, I'm a dev, I'm launching this new thing, and I've got my initial Rails framework. Cool. Four weeks later, oh, I've got a thing that does a thing. Cool. Four months later, it's now in production. During that time, we can iterate. We can start with one T2 or two T2 micros in production, and if they reach thresholds, we can increase the size or increase the number of machines. There's no reason in many of our cases to go out with, say, a C3 4X large from day one. It's cheap and easy to change Amazon. It ain't hardware. You didn't buy it and wait five months for it to arrive. You can change it within seconds. Plus, you can auto scale. Do you have some production T2? We have a lot of production T2 micros. Um, I would hazard a guess that T2 micros is probably the most favorite instance type in um, AP Southeast 2, because it seems like everyone I talk to runs only T2 micros. Um, We've got Tito Micros doing 150 requests per second um, in our production environment. And you know, we just have a bunch of them, or just scale them if need be, but you'll be surprised at what, what one can do alone. Because they've got just enough RAM to be useful. A gig is actually really, really good, whereas half a gig is just a little bit too little when you run out and just start swapping. One gig, perfect. Reserved instances. So this is what I mentioned before, where you basically commit to Amazon that you're gonna spend X amount of hours of, of compute with them over X number of periods. So the approach historically was always you had to put cash up front to get discounts. But it's actually gone a bit different now. They've got a whole bunch of options around their on-demand compute, sorry, on their reserve compute. And you can say, actually, I'm a poor startup. I don't want to spend any money up front. But I know that this T2 Micro, this production enterprise T2 Micro, is going to need to run for one year. I'll do no upfront reserved where I guarantee to pay for one year of a teacher micro whether I use it or not, but I get 20% off the price. Really, really good way of making savings in your production environments where you can't necessarily do more radical stuff like turning off the website overnight. Um, people apparently like to read it overnight. Um, good value, 20 to 30% on most instance types. Uh, as much as 75%, I actually looked through the pricing to make sure that was a real claim from Amazon, and it is. Um, I think I found 74%. 
Um, so mentioning our bill a bit, that's our ratio of reserves to on demands. So that's our, so we've got almost no pre-prod systems in the on demand. We've got a little bit left in there. The main reason for that is we didn't want to reserve every single machine we have because then you've got no room to play when you downsize or change a particular, a particular cluster from one size to another. So we try to reserve 80% of our systems to get the best values while still offering flexibility. So I thought you'd give an example. So M4 Larges, I really like M4 Larges, they're a great, great workhorse, great value. Um, no upfront money, so you know, hey, no cash today, five years interest free. Um, no upfront money, 29% saving over the, the lifespan of one year. 58% saving over a three year term if you also give Amazon a thousand bucks up front. So depending on your business, if you've got a big stack of cash lying around, you can get quite good value for this. If you've got no money, as long as you know you're going to use the compute, you can say no up front and take advantage of it. There is a little bit of a trap, and the trap is you have guaranteed to Amazon that you're going to buy that compute for that duration. Now if you build a whole bunch of, uh, T a whole bunch of M4 larges, and then tomorrow they go, hey guys, we've got M5 and it's twice as fast and the same price, you're going to be a little bit pissed. But you actually can't do a whole lot about that because you've committed to buying that. There is some stuff around markets. You can actually sell your reserve compute to someone else who wants them, and you can try and down. You can also swap it out for certain sizes of the same type. I think you can split like an M4X large into two M4 larges and things like that. Uh, but generally, the principle I'd say is if you've bought reserved, make sure you expect to use reserved. Just like buying hardware, don't buy hardware if you don't need it. Um, Teaching micro, which is you know definitely the key production workhorse in the uh, AP Southeast Two cloud. Um, one year term, zero dollars up front, save 20%. It's great, you've got a whole bunch of little reverse proxy boxes, to your micros, boom, set them up, save some cash. All right, so reserves, yeah, yeah, that's all the same stuff. How else can I save money? If you adopt the newer technologies that come out of Amazon, you will benefit big time. Now the whole point of going to cloud was that you could innovate faster and better. You could do things quicker, you didn't have to go, hey, We've got a five-year depreciation plan for this gear, so we're going to use it for five years and do not expect to do anything exciting in that time. If Amazon say, hey, we've got a cool new product tomorrow, use that cool new product. Save yourself money. So for example, up, up top there, I've got, it's probably hard to read again, but this is from Cloud Checker, which is a commercial tool. It's telling me I've got 15 EBS provisioned IOPS volumes that could be converted to general SSD. That's probably because we spun them up before GP2 even existed. So now, if we suddenly convert those to GP2, we can actually get, for the volume of usage we're using, the same sort of performance, but we can save 300 bucks a month. Not bad, right? I mean, that's actually no real work whatsoever. It's just changing a few flags. I've got previous generation systems. We've got M1s, M2s, and 3s and 4s. We've been around for a little while. I could migrate some of those older generation systems onto newer, onto newer products, like the M4 series, and get savings and additional performance. Things like the M4 CPUs, are really, really fast, and it's actually quite noticeable compared to the older generation machines when you start using them. You can make savings by, by changing those machine types, but these are in, in lies for trap with reserved instances. If you've gone and brought you know 100% of your compute on reserved, you can't suddenly jump to that new machine type because you've committed to using those other ones. It's a bunch of tr tricks you can try and do, but fundamentally, you're possibly stuck with where you, where you are. Lambda. Now, for those of you who haven't used Lambda, it's a really cool new product from Amazon, and you basically upload code or a program into Amazon, and they run it for you in the background containerization type thing, which you don't even see, and you pay by the 100 milliseconds. So for example, you could say, every time a file gets dumped into the S S3 bucket, please go and do a purge on our CDN. And you could write that in a few lines of Python, and then you'll pay 100 milliseconds every time someone loads a new file and you get flushed from your, from your network. You could say, when someone uploads this new CloudFormation stack to this bucket, please go and build out the systems in that stack. There's some really interesting stuff you can do with it. Um, we're using Lambda for things like background jobs. You know, hey, this thing that's really annoying that was, that was once a cron, cron job on some forgotten pet, well, this job can now be a Lambda. We do things like um, grab JSON feeds from our third party suppliers who can't handle our load, copy them into S3, it's basically a curl when a push to S3, but we can even run a server or find a server that has to run it and you have that generic tools box that's got a million things on it, or we chuck in a lambda, and we don't have to worry about servers, and it just works. 
And when it does fail because the supplier has changed the URL and broken everything, it sends us an alert via CloudWatch. That's really, really handy. There's no servers involved. And I'm, I'm a server guy. I love my Linux boxes and Unix and all that sort of stuff. But sometimes not running a server is actually really nice. Um, it's almost like this liberating experience going, I don't have to worry about this. Um, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a amazing solution to solve all problems. The major problem with Lambda is that you can't necessarily go, hey, here's an app, run it in Lambda. You have to design for the Lambda environment. You have to break your app into chunks that can execute independently. Um, you're statelessly, you're not going to say, hey, here's my WordPress blog, check out Lambda. But you are going to say, here's this background con job, I can chuck that in there. Um, pricing. So the free tier, which gives you a ridiculous amount of seconds free anyway, but even if you went all on board and you somehow consumed all your free tier, one dollar US gives you just under five thousand seconds, eighty minutes of compute time. Now that might seem okay. Hang on, Jeffro, that's a bit shit. I've got computers I can buy on EC2, which cost less than that per hour, and it's true. But this is perfect for that system. It doesn't need to be there all the time. If you're only calling it, you know, five times an hour, this is way cheaper than running compute. If you need somewhat infinite parallel scalability, this is very, very useful because you can say, every time someone loads this page and does a, does a web hook to this Lambda, run something in DynamoDB or S3, you can scale that infinitely sideways. You don't have to worry about AS groups and trust, bring them up and bring them online. It just works. Really, really cool system. Worth checking out, but it's not going to necessarily work for everyone just because of the limitations around design. Auto scaling, I mean, this is like textbook Amazon stuff, right? Oh, guys, welcome to the cloud. You can auto scale things. Whoa. If you can do auto scaling, massively worthwhile. If you haven't quite got your technology stack and your processes to the level required to do auto scaling reliably, particularly in production, you can get more bang for buck just by optimizing your machine sizes. Most environments at that level of maturity are going to have machine sizes that are way over spec. And that's an easy way to save some money really quickly. Auto scale also requires actually a whole bunch of work. Um, it very quickly shows you what pets you have when you try to start auto scaling them. All of a sudden, you realise actually this one box, which we think was fully automated by a puppet or chef, does require these four extra steps when we launch it. But you know it's fine because Brian always does that. Oh, uh, but Brian's not awake at two a.m. Ah, uh, fuck. Um, no problem. So it shows you where you've got weaknesses in your workflow. I mean, you should fix those absolutely, but just be wary. There is quite a uh, learning curve towards that. Um, it requires flawless execution. You know, you've got to bake your AMI images, you've got to have a deploy system that's rock solid, you've got to have every part come online. You can't go, oh no, Ruby Gems was down and my servers didn't build and we fell offline because we relied on a third party service. You have to be able to handle those failures if you're using this in a production environment. And that does make auto scanning require quite a bit of work. Still, still very worthwhile, but it's not necessarily the easiest way to save money on Amazon Cloud. There are easier ways you can sort out. And the main reason for that is auto scanning generally shows all the tech debt you have. Tech debt's expensive, it's painful. People like to avoid that. This way we fix that. We've sized everything perfectly, we're running everything on one T2 micro, perfect. Um, we've got auto scanning for that one T2 micro, so it could become two, you know, getting Denver crazy here. What else can we do? ELBs. Now, ELBs are very interesting because they're either very cheap or very expensive, depending on what you're doing with them. Because the ELB is basically like, I think, 20 bucks a month. And that's 20 bucks a month for your pre-prod system that does one call every hour. And that's 20 bucks a month for your production system plus the data transfer. But that still means you're spending that 20 bucks a month for every ELB that you're launching. So if you've got idle ELBs or ELBs with one server behind them, it's actually a waste of money. It gets a little tricky though, because it's very hard to say on Amazon, hey, here's an endpoint, Please point it to this server and this auto scanning group because servers change and you have to change the C names all the time. So you have to write a whole bunch of scripts and automation process. Sometimes it's easy to go, this is create an AS group with an ELB with one box in it because it solved the business problem very quick and very easily. But when you've got a lot of ELBs, that 20 bucks can add up very, very quickly and you could make some good savings there. Sometimes it's worse. Um, ELBs are actually the ultimate market tax because We've got a lot of ELBs with no backend servers. So you're like, well, you're load balancing nothing and doing nothing, but you're costing me money. Why do we have you? Um, sometimes it's just dumb stuff, like, hey, we spool up a box we're experimenting on, and then we broke it, and then it's not doing anything anymore. Um, in fact, find all your ELBs with no active backends, and then see what servers are actually on the backends, because they're all fading their health checks. They're all trash, and just delete them all. Boom, gone. There you go, save yourself some money. Go have some beers. Um, <laughs> 
shop around on platforms. Now we're talking a lot so far about stuff you can do with Amazon products to change you know, how much you make or how much you cost, products you can use to save money. But actually platforms aren't all equal. Certain Linux distributions are more expensive than others and Windows is more expensive as well. So if generic Linuxes, Amazon Linux, CentOS, Ubuntu, um, Debian, standard Amazon pricing. As soon as I start moving to my commercial rail or SLES, I'm spending a lot more money very quickly. As soon as I move to Windows, again, also spending a lot of money. In fact, the rail and SLES are actually getting close to, um, to Microsoft Windows in terms of pricing. Now, of course, it depends on your environment. If you're a .NET shop, you're not going to say, hey guys, let's run on .NET Core on Linux, that stuff's production ready. Um, but you could look at what you're running. If you've got one guy who knows Windows only, you're running five servers, might as well pay the Microsoft tax, run it on there. But if you've got a large team and you're running you know, 50 Java apps and 50 Node, um, 50 .NET apps, run your .NET apps on Windows, run your Java apps on Linux, and you save a whole bunch of money. And your team should hopefully have those multi skills already. If not, it's worth developing them. So there's an impact to choosing certain, certain platforms. And I mean, some of this is still worthwhile. I mean, CentOS and RHEL are basically the same thing. But with RHEL, when my vendor says we only support RHEL, I can say, well, it's broken and you only support RHEL and running on RHEL, so it's fully enterprise and synergistic and just make it fucking work for fuck's sake, what we pay you for. There are reasons you might want to choose to do that. But consider it. You can save some good money. One exception is Teacher Micro. The Windows price is the same as Linux price. Just, you know, really good value. All my .NET boxes run T2 Micros because I don't have much <laughs> .NET. And great. Best thank you, but. So I've given you a whole bunch of boring review work. You're going to go home, you're going to go to work tomorrow and be like, well, I could sit through this fucking TPS report, or I could do all the stuff Jeff I suggested. That sounds really boring. I'll do a TPS report. Much more fun. What if there was a magical way you could drop the cost of your compute and save money, and then take your good friend Jeffro out to the bar for a <laughs> lot of alcohol beyond all levels of responsibility? Well, I've got a deal for you, son. There is such a way to make such savings. Spot pricing. This is almost as fun as my zero stocks. It goes up, it goes down. Sometimes you don't want to look at it. It's great. It's great. You can absolutely demolish your massive bills. It's basically computing that is as cheap as chips. So let's say, some, let's say a bag of chips is two bucks. Now, this, I know Amazon bills in US dollars, so it's actually quite expensive bag of chips, but I guarantee you can spend four bucks on a bag of chips at your local dairy. You can get a T1 micro on demand for 14 bucks a month, or you can get a T1 micro on spot pricing for two dollars twenty-three. Admittedly, T1 Micro, nobody likes T1 Micros, they're terrible. So what about something actually good? You can spend $120 a month on an M4 large. Good value machine, really good performance if you use it properly. Or you can spend $13 using the spot price, which is what it was at last night. That's a price of two hot zombie 500 ml bottles. In fact, if you convert every M4 large to a spot price machine, for every one you convert, give your team 16 be of those beers every month. Because that's how much money you just save. It's an incredible, incredible difference. So there's a couple of limitations. T2 series aren't available at spot price. I'm guessing because, sorry, some price line market model where it's too expensive to actually provide it at spot price and will cannibalize products. I don't know. No one tells me anything fun from Amazon. Stupid NDAs and not too many exciting things. Um, is there, is there a slight issue around terminations when the market fluctuates? Now, stocks are kind of you know complex, but some of the stocks go up, some of the stocks go down, and there's something about that. Um, so about the spot price. That's a T1 Micro. Again, really boring because no one loves them, and they deserve to die on a fire, but they are really cheap because you run your blog for two bucks. But that's a M4X Large. And you can see there, we've actually finally got a whole bunch of jumping on our, on our graph there. That is the Amazon spot price over a three-month period. Now, the way Spot works, as I say to Amazon, I would like a M4X large server, please. But I'm really tight, and I don't just want to spend any more than $1 for that server. Amazon goes, sweet, we've got reserve capacity, we will sell it to you for $1. But come February, February or January 24th, when we see our Spot price starting to just jump over a dollar, my $1 ultimate value servers are suddenly going to fall over, because that price has surpassed the limit and someone sort of says, hey, you're not paying me the right amount based on the spot, based on the demand that the market has, I'm going to terminate your system. So it's an amazing way to save money as long as you can handle sudden and inevitable death of your machine. In fact, that can come really suddenly. So 
you know, you're cruising along on your M3 medium, you're spending basically nothing, like one cent, you know, Buzzy's crying because he can't buy food for his children tonight, and then, boom, one dollar, game over. All, all your fucking 50 cent uh, M3 mediums just got killed and slaughtered. That's the risk of spot price. If Amazon had, say, an AZ failure, which never happens in uh, Sydney, that spot price will suddenly shoot through the roof and you're going to lose a whole bunch of machines. If someone goes, hey, I want to do some GPU mining or some other great thing that requires massive amounts of compute, you'll see things like the C3 series, C4 series, suddenly massively increase in price because someone said, hey, I want a whole bunch of these. The supply has diminished, demand has increased, therefore the cost increases. So you have to actually be able to handle state. Now, spot's great for batch jobs. If you have batch jobs that need action sometime between here and here, and it takes this much time, you can probably say, yeah, if it dies and it comes back in four hours, that's fine, it will eventually complete, then it can maintain state in you know, Dynamo or SQL or whatever other um, store you fancy using. It gets a little more tricky when you've got stateful applications and try to deal with those, or even applications that require a clean shutdown rather than just vanishing. Um, this means your application code potentially needs to be state compatible. One example would be if you have a cluster of weird applications, like say, for example, Elasticsearch, and your cluster goes, right, we've reached max price, we're tearing down an Elasticsearch environment, that system needs to go, okay, I need to save my state, put it, put it, put it back up, tear myself down, and when I recover, be able to restore that state. That requires a reasonable level of sophistication in your automation tools and your, and your, and your practices. Um, so TLDR, there's a lot of information. Where do you want to start with looking at this stuff? How do you actually get into this stuff in your organization? Lazy ops always wins. Go for the easiest stuff first. And there's no point trying to optimize you know, how to save 100 bucks on a particular machine in a really complicated manner when you can just change this big giant R32X large wasting off of money down to another machine. Go for the easy stuff first. Every saving is a saving. If it takes five minutes, just get in there and do it. Start looking for waste. Look for unused resources, idle ELBs. That's the worst kind of waste. It's waste that's not even doing anything. It's just sitting there. Like, that's, that's horrible. Just go kill that. Check your sizings. Very, very easy to do. Very easy to adjust. You know, even, even pets can be resized generally quite easily. Because a pet has got a stateful disk attached, so you can stop the box, change its size, start it back up. Five minute outage. Boom. Saves you X million dollars worth doing. You also want to promote your success in your organization. And the same way you go, hey guys, we made this 10% 10, 10 faster, you also want to say, hey, we made it 10% cheaper. You know, if everyone's just doing stuff in the background, other teams don't see what's going on. They don't realize that actually cost is something I should look at. Cost is something that people are actually working on. You've got to broadcast that and make people aware of it. Um, investigate spot pricing. So I'll give you a little bit of a taste of what you can do with spot pricing in terms of, in terms of savings. Um, we now run almost all of our pre-production systems on spot price. I believe, this is for New Zealand, I can't speak for the wider business. I believe I have four machines in pre-prod that are not spot price. Everything else is. And that includes stateful systems with disk local disk attached. It includes clusters like Elasticsearch and all of all those associated systems. What we did to deal with the whole stateful problem was Amazon nicely does give you a two minute heads up before they shoot your spot price machine. So when that spot price hits the limit, and they go right, you're going down, they give you two minutes, which gives you enough time to poll, if you've got poll regularly, find out, hey, am I still alive, am I still alive, oh, you're about to kill me. We wrote a tool called Spotter, it's not open sourced yet, but I want to try and do it this week, because there's no reason it can't be. And Spotter goes, listens to those termination notices, when it gets one, it then shuts down services that you've defined. So please shut down weird proprietary clustering system. Please shut down annoying stateful thing. And then finally, it looks at all the attached disk volumes on EBS and creates snapshots for each of those volumes with particular tagging. When a fresh machine comes alive, whether it's five minutes later when the spot price collapses or a day later, that fresh machine launches and initiates a discovery process to find its past, its past life, basically. Give me the snapshots that were taken off me before I died. So if you've got stateful disks, you can still do spot pricing. If you've got other systems like Elasticsearch, you can do a whole backup to S3, you don't have to worry about the disks, you just provision new disks, restore the backup, very, very easy. But there's no system that you can't make work with this approach, or almost no system, I'm sure it'll be something that doesn't quite function. Um, having said that, this is really cool, spot pricing can be made quite, quite smooth and quite uh, minimal impact. Just don't use it in production, like, 
there are people who do spot reduction, and there's some really, really interesting blog posts about that. People kind of basically hedged the risk of an outage in any one AV or region by running across multiple discrete regions and handling the spot price changes across them and figuring out where the best deals are and how to handle fault. There's also techniques involving bringing up on demand and spot in parallel and trying to mix and match the system types. They're both very, very hard to do. If you've got the skill set and the, and the justification for doing so, it's worth investigating. But that is a very, very risky process compared to doing the easier wins of like pre-production environments. Sometimes production, it's just safe to say, reserve instant search, and I don't have to explain to the business why our algorithm didn't work and we lost all our systems when spot price went too high. That's the kind of risk that you're dealing with there. Um, I think it's spot price mine. Yeah, well, well the interesting uh, about that. You can only set, I think it's three times or four times the machine cost. There's actually a limit. Otherwise, some, some Muppet will go, hey, 999999, I'll always get a machine. They've actually capped it, so at a certain level, it will just reach a limit and you can't stand beyond that. Having said that, if you're not careful, when you put in a bid of, say, $3 for a machine that's normally $1, you could be spending three times the amount it normally costs you, and then you've got to decide, is that worth it to me? Is it worth spending $3 an hour instead of $1 an hour to ride out a bump, or hopefully ride out a bump, but, or is my tooling advanced enough that I can just say, fuck it, turn off, wait, turn back on? It also depends what it is. I mean, if our pre-production systems go offline, it is annoying for our developers, but the frequency that happens is very rare. We actually manage it appropriately so we cause not too much disruption. And the disruption of losing maybe one hour of developer time every four or five months is more than outweighed by the massive financial savings we make. I mean, that was 120 bucks to 13 bucks. That's some big savings. Like, I'll happily buy the devs beer from a budget, not for my own card, in case the devs are watching. Um, I hope you buy the devs beer for having one hour of disruption for the amount of savings that we're making is worth it. So having said that, is all this hassle worth it overall? You know, like, like every uh, respectful, uh, respectful engineer, I've got a whole bunch of DL380s sitting in my lounge, you know? Why not use those? Much, much better value. This hardware thing, you know, you pay a certain price, you know what you're getting. Don't have to worry about cost explosions. Well, it is still worth it. Cloud is by far the better opportunity. It's way better than spending millions of dollars investing into data center operations, maintenance, aircon systems, and then fixing when you accidentally flood the data center with a new gaff if you spend money refilling it, and not as ever happened. Um, it's better than waiting weeks for hardware to arrive, racking it up, and then realizing you brought the wrong gear, or that actually those new CPUs weren't as fast as you thought they were, or when the dev said they need one gig of heat, they actually need 10, things like that. And the other key part is, even if you can get to a scale where you can get cost equivalency or even cost savings in a physical sense, you're not going to be able to innovate as fast as your competitors on Amazon. And that's a really big factor for us. Cost is important, but so is the ability to deliver new products and continue to innovate. If all things are equal, the innovation is worth it. Plus, the Amazon user group is way more fun than DL3 actually breaking out user group. Um, you know, this, is, this is a good time. So, I'm going to open up to questions, comments, abuse, you guys telling me I've done it all wrong. Um, happy to go and deep dive any particular thing I've covered. Um, hopefully I've given you a reasonably car reasonable coverage over all the stuff we're doing. But I'm happy to deep dive in a bit more. Before I do, I'm just going to put these on screen. Um, blatant self-promotion from my blog. Uh, blatant self-promotion from my colleague in Australia's blog. Uh, Paul Wakeford is the architect over in Australia for Fairfax AU. Um, did a lot of interesting blog posts about cool stuff happening in the Amazon space. Kind of like a Jeff Barr kind of sum up. Here's this cool thing I found, here's this cool thing I found. It's worth checking out, having a read of his blog. Um, stuff technology blog, I have to confess, infrastructure team doesn't have a blog there because we're too busy doing infrastructure. Um, it's a bit of a failing on my part. But if you're interested in general UX, and agile and other stuff, we've got a whole bunch of posts there. Um, and I've got a link to our GitHub page as well. That's where we both a lot of our source code around things like Cloud Cycler, Flywheel, and hopefully in the future I'll put Spotter up there as well so we can check that out. Um, that being said, any questions that the audience would like? So you're running all this on a T2 micro, right? So we're all headed at the same time. <laughs> There's a T2 ri micro running Varnish, yeah, I'm all good. There's credits will be used up. <laughs> yeah, we've got some ridiculous workloads running on T2 micro. So if we've got one box of like 50 requests a second just transmitting through it, um, it's basically an Nginx server, and it does, we call it a SED server, because it takes a feed from a vendor that's quite slow making changes, and it seeds content on it, and then shoves it out. So things like HTTP to HTTPS, um, very, very handy. Um, recommend, it's much cheaper than six hours of consultancy services. Um, yeah, good boxes. Do you have any, anything close to real time to, uh, to expose the cost of things to, to 
No, the, all the tools that we've really looked at so far all rely on the Amazon billing CSVs, and those are generate something daily, but they take a long time to crunch. Yeah. That's why CloudCheck is really frustrating me at the moment. It's the bills generated daily, but then it takes you three days to process this bill. What are you doing? Like, I want to look at it now. You know, ideally it'll be real time. Um, we did an experiment with a thing a while back. We've got a tool internally called Instantly, and it shows us a well, it shows us groupings of systems by BU and project. So I can say, hey. I'm a developer, I'm not sure about your infrastructure build, but if I look at project, super amazing app, I can see what servers are in there, and we start putting pricing information in there based on the on-demand pricing. But then we ruined that all by introducing spot pricing, which we can't rely or can't easily look at and get metrics for. Um, having said that, we could write some stuff that tries to figure out the current spot price and calculate what we're spending, uh, but it's not ideal. It's, just, it's, it's a real difficult problem. Um, and like I said earlier, I'd love to see things like you know, tools like New Relic integrate with Amazon and show me my cost for my compute. I want to know for every one of those requests per minute what I'm actually paying to run it. We don't really have it yet. What was your split between reserved on demand and spot? You know, like reserved versus um, so on in our production like six or eight one. Yes, yeah, about that. So about in production, um, I don't know what our spot is. I had it somewhere. Yeah. Right. Uh, only problem was, I think when I grabbed these metrics, I didn't. Uh, there's another one with a whole bunch of other metrics. Somewhere. Fuck now. There we are. So, I, only problem is, I don't know what time scale that was for. I can't remember because I can't paste it. I'm suspicious I've done it for two weeks, not a, a whole month. Uh, but it's all about split in terms of hours. Um, and it does depend too. I mean, the NZBU. We're pretty much 90% of our pre-prod is spot price, but of the whole company, we make up half of the spot usage, which is actually kind of depressing when you think about it, because a lot of teams haven't really got on board the whole spot bandwagon yet. Having said that, it goes back to my point around teams at different, different speeds, operate at different levels, and you've got to give them tooling and stuff. We're kind of blazing the trail a little bit internally with some of the stuff. Um, if I grab the other group metric as well, that was, uh, I really hate doing this. Can you make a slide today? Um, yeah, I'll spit up PDF. And we've recorded this hopefully. Um, we were trying to record it on the webcam and on a phone. So you know, proper enterprise grade video recording system. Um, if we get something out of that, I'll share it out. Um, so yeah, I was I think my ratios are pretty good. I'm pretty happy with that at the moment. Did you guys try sending money for a tech team? No, we haven't. Um, not for me, but I can check it out though. And in terms of cross account stuff. Does that, del that delete bot, is that able to run in one of the... So, uh, delete, delete bot is um, my colleague Paul when he gets annoyed with reconciliation. Yeah. And we tell the users that delete bot has identified their system and it's going to delete it. Um, really, it's Paul going, fuck safely. Right. But yeah. are you able to so, yes, it can run across the account. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it can run across the account. Um, and I think you can have that can run so one consolidated account and discover resources and all the other siblings. I haven't heard of such things. Having said that, it technically would be possible. I mean, you could create a user that had permissions to jump to other accounts, and that bot could use it and jump through. Um, we've used some automation tools that we use Graffiti Monkey to tag things. So Graffiti Monkey goes, oh, you've got an EC2 instance that's tagged project foo app, but it's got a volume attached, and that volume's not tagged. Oh, well, I'll tag it based on the instance tag. So it does a lot of cleanup. It basically goes through and spray paints tags and everything to keep our building under control. Um, I didn't actually mention that. It's a really good tool. It's worth checking out. I think it's... One of the Netflix family of tools. Um, really, really handy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think like you know, Chaos Monkey stuff as well. Um, some really cool stuff comes out of that team, actually. It's pretty impressive. Cool. So, your question on uh, like real time cost control and things. I know that it's not ongoing, but if you've got a cloud formation stack, there is an option in the command line to do a cost estimate. So, you can. Particularly if they're deploying a lot of stuff, and you do to deploying a lot of stuff like cloud formation, they can run a, a cost estimate mm. online and it'll look at the stack and go, oh, we think it'll cost you about this much per hour. That's kind of neat. Um, I guess the only downside is once you start using Spot, you can't see it so much. Having said that, if you're saving so much money on Spot, you're probably not too worried about the actual uh, estimated costs. So, would you recommend putting uh, each business unit in its own account? Yeah, it is, it is an annoying balancing game of at what point do I have too much maintenance over here to try and manage too many accounts versus what 
at what point does the master account become an absolute disaster? With in the latter situation, we started with one account, everyone dropped the ball because hey, Amazon was awesome, way better than VMware, this user like crazy. And then we realized we have 50 BUs in one account and the costs are very, very hard to allocate. Um, we're an internal only organization, like we don't have systems we run for customers, we have products uh, or projects. In our case, I would advocate for splitting by BU, and in certain certain cases, I might even consider splitting by the project. Because um, you might get one project that's 100k a month, and you might have another, everything else that BU might only be a one grand, you might want to separate them out so you can see which is which. Um, but you generally would advocate for splitting. If you're a consultancy, I would advocate for, if you're hosting stuff for your customers, having a sub or a separate account for each customer and then putting it to consolidated one. Has VPC pairing been a problem? Are you finding your effort into keeping the subnets a little laughing? Yeah, subnets are a pain, um, pain situation. So we've got VPC pairing in place. The main problem we've got is actually a master account where the submission was done in a very traditional sense. So I was like, hey, doing this cloud thing, we need to address it, right. This group of systems are web servers, they get a slash 24. This group of systems are database servers, they get a slash 24. And of course, we've now screwed ourselves over because it's a terrible naming scheme or a terrible numbering scheme. Uh, but it's learning, right? You do your first account, it's going to have a whole bunch of mistakes. Problem is, if your first account becomes your massive account, you're stuck with them forever, um, or for a long period of time at least. Um, so you have to be paying. The one cool thing that's come out, you might not have seen this yet, is I think it's day only. You can now reference a security group in one account via a VPC relationship to another account. So you don't have to rely on submitting only for ACLs between accounts. You can actually say, hey, the box is an SG12, they're good, let them in, do everything else to deny, which is kind of nice. Cool, well, like, Jeff, are still going to be around, I suppose. I'll be around for a bit, so feel free to come ask me any questions and happy to address. Um, worst case, drop me an email, happy to answer anything via that as well. Cool. Thank you for coming. Thank you for organizing um, this The menu was for free, so go buy a drink. Um, hopefully we'll be in the same venue again in six weeks' time. Um, and um, yeah, we're going to be safe for now. Thank you.